Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So welcome back to uh, the second part of the 19th lecture. We have now seen in detail the spatial lag model, including its interpretations and impact on inference, right? So we are now going to move to this uh, next popular form of a spatial regression model called as a spatial error model or even called as the spatial autoregressive error model auto regressive error model. Those of you who are used to time series notation will be able to connect with it. So, you know, in short, it is called as the SAR model, okay. So, I am going to start with motivation. I am going to motivate this model before I get into the detail, technical details of it. So, first is that this model, the SAR model represents a situation where spatial dependence uh, in the error term arises due to omitted random factors. Right? So, there are some random factors that explain why and we omit them and they are now a part of the error term. Right? That is why, you know, this type of a phenomenon or this term is also defined as or termed as or defined as a uh, nuisance, it is a nuisance spatial dependence term. Okay. And then, uh, you know, it is employed in situations it is employed in situations that are characterized, this is an important point, characterized by a mismatch in spatial process uh, with uh, the spatial scale of observation. So, if you are studying a process, a population process or a natural process which has very high resolution, uh, you know, which is very high resolution in nature, but the data that you have are aggregated in nature, right? Then such, you know, situations will be characterized by nuisance. Uh, spatial random error because there is no way for me to account for, uh, you know, spatial process at the resolution that it actually occurs, right. I have data for something at district level, at state level, uh, but the actual process, for example, crime. Now, the spatial resolution of how crime is observed uh, might be much, much more finer in terms of the data are actually recorded than the data that are in public domain. Right? In that situation, you know, such a mismatch can never be accounted in a model. So, it is going to enter into the error term as a random, you know, disturbance, a nuisance term, right? And you can imagine, you know, such a, uh, this type of a categorization is quite general. I mean, this is, this is something that we encounter a lot of the time. And that is why spatial error model happens to be a very popular form of model, right? Right. So, uh, 
I'll give you an example. I'll, as an example, we can think about uh, combining high resolution, resolution, let's say land use data, something that we have seen, that is, let's say the Bhuvan data, right? And let's say we are combining that as a function of uh, something like farmer education or farmer education disparity uh, in terms of gender ratio. Things like, you know, uh, the dropout rates for boys and girls, the education levels, the skill development levels and so on and so forth, the training that let's say women farmers have versus men farmers. So in, in households that are, have women heads versus, uh, you know, men as heads or male uh, members of a family as the head of the farmers, then you may have these systematic differences and you might want to account for them in terms of how land use decisions are taken. But such variables are usually only available at district level or at taluk level, at block level, at state level. Whereas land use, let's say with Bhuvan, is available at a very high resolution. So on the left hand side, I have a variable which is of the resolution of 50 meter by 50 meter, right? And on the right hand side, I have a variable which is at the district level. So there are many, many, many pixels of land use that are contained within one district. And this mismatch is going to cause, you know, a random nuisance in my model and hence, uh, you know, will make the spatial error model really useful, okay? A spatial, Finally, I want to just say that a spatial error process, a spatial error process impacts the efficiency of estimates. Okay. Right. So earlier we saw that you know a spatial lag, you know, version of it, it actually led to a uh, 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 bias in the estimates. Here, I will not have the bias, and we've seen the reasons earlier, why there is no bias with the spatial error, spatial dependence in the error term. Um, we saw that with much more, you know, uh, a restricted form, right? Now we have a much more general form with the spatial lag notation or the notion of spatial lags, right? Okay, so having understood this, let's move on to the mathematical uh, treatment of a spatial error model. So the SAR, model can be then written as the following. So we have a y equals x beta plus u, something that we are very used to. Now here we have variance of u given x is not equal to a situation which we are very uh, fond of where the off diagonal elements are zero, diagonal elements are exactly the same across all ui's. Right here I'm not going to have that situation. Rather, what I'm going to have is, uh, is, is, is that covariance of ui and uj will not be equal to zero for some i not equal to j. I wrote this even when we had, uh, you know, uh, earlier when we had just introduced the SAR model. Okay. Now, you know, notation wise, we can write, you know, note the variance of u given x. Again, u is an n by 1 term. So the variance by itself is going to be n by n. That's why I have i is n by n. Sigma squared is just a scalar. So it's just 1 by 1. I'm just checking y is n by 1, x is n by k, beta is k by 1. So I have n by 1 and u is n by 1. So all consistent. Now this Variance of u given x can be written as expectation u, u transpose given x, okay? How is that possible? Well, u is n by 1, u transpose is going to be 1 by n. So overall, I have a n by n, which is the same as the matrix on the left hand side. What is being used in this definition is, a, is the definition of the variance. So variance of u given x, you know, by definition, you know, by definition, it's a little aside I'm doing for you, just in case people not, not have seen this stuff before. 
variance of u given x is going to be expectation u u prime given x minus expectation of u given x the whole square dot product okay now this term is equal to 0 by assumption 2 of my regression model okay so you can go back and revise the regression model where we did so that's why i can write variance of u given x as just expectation u u prime given x okay and similarly you know i can write the covariance as expectation ui times uj given x it's not comma expectation times ui uj is not equal to 0 for some i not equal to j well it could also be all okay i mean it could also be non zero for all i not equal to j but at least some for some i some of the off diagonal elements are non zero so what this situation this second condition basically implies is that the off diagonal elements of the variance covariance matrix the variance covariance matrix are non zero okay so we are you know basically basically we are working with a non spherical uh, you know uh, variance covariance structure right and i'm just using these terms because you know earlier when I had introduced the regression, we have done a review of it. Well, I've discussed all of these. What are non-spherical errors? What do we do when we have non-spherical errors? You know, how what's the impact? How do we reconcile these situations? You have to go back and revisit these things, uh, you know, again and again. So, in terms of specification, I'm just going to say model specification. What we are saying is that we have uh, y equals x beta plus u, uh, where such that u is equal to lambda w u plus e, where this e is distributed normal with zero mean and a homoscedastic variance covariance structure. So this E is what we are used to when there is no spatial dependence in errors. And the spatial error dependence in errors is explained through the weights matrix, right? So now, you know, uh, this W U can is nothing but the lag in U. Because W is by itself a n by n, U is n by 1, that's why this U L is also n by 1. So it's a lag just like we defined spatial lag for the outcome variable W Y. Now we are working with this w u, right? So this is the spatial lag of the error term in parent regression. Why do I say parent? Why do I use this term parent regression? Well, I have two, you know, you can think of two regression models. One is on the outcome variable y and the second one is on the error term, right? So u is the error in the first equation. The second equation u itself is dependent on its on its on its uh, you know on its lag, and what remains is now a random term e, which is the homoscedastic error term, right? So e this implies that e is homoscedastic. U is heteroscedastic, right? I mean, this implies u is heteroscedastic. So this is, uh, you know, all about uh, model specification. So let's rewrite this thing and move forward with our analysis. So, uh, you know, we have y equals x beta plus u such that u is equal to uh, lambda w u plus e where e is normal multivariate normal zero mean 
sigma squared i n very very quickly my dimensions are n by 1 y is n by 1 x is n by k beta is k by 1 so i have n by 1 good and n by 1 u is n by 1 w is n by n u is n by 1 so i have n by 1 lambda is a scalar right so it's a 1 by 1 e is a n by 1 so e is n by 1 so it's mean term that is the distribution mean population mean is n by 1 and the variance covariance obviously will be a n by n right so everything falls in line so far as i understand it okay now we can write we can rewrite the error structure uh, we can rewrite the error structure as under so i can say u minus lambda w u equals e which implies i have u times sorry i n minus lambda times u equals e right or like i did earlier i could pre multiply this by i n minus lambda w inverse and i will be able to rewrite u okay so now my variance covariance matrix now our uh, let's see the variance covariance matrix of u can be written as okay so i'm going to now say expectation x so i'm putting the conditional as a subscript just to have a concise notation u u prime is equal to expectation of u is i n minus lambda w inverse u times i n minus lambda w inverse u the whole thing uh, transpose okay i did a mistake here right i guess you will be able to recognize the mistake well it should not be u it should be e because i am just writing the form of u right so i have i n minus lambda w inversed e and then multiplied by i n inversed e transposed I'm going to rewrite this thing again now. So I have uh, uh, this thing is equal. I'm going to take the transpose of the second term. Okay. So this is my. So I'm going to just do that. So I have equal to expectation i n minus lambda w. This will be written as is e. Now this transpose will become e transpose i n minus lambda w inverse transposed okay all right so i've done nothing i've simply done this now expectation remember is conditional on x now this expectation operator is a linear operator so it will start to enter the you know matrix form inside i lambda and w all are independent of x so the expectation I operator can start to go right in they are degenerate terms right so i have this is equal to x i n minus lambda w inverse expectation e e transpose times i n minus lambda w inverse transpose right now this expectation e e transpose well first of all this step is because expectation is a linear operator okay and expectation e e prime is nothing but sigma squared i n right this is the variance covariance structure of the error term right so i can now move forward and say this is equal to i n minus lambda w inverse sigma squared i n 
minus lambda w inverse the transpose which can be written as sigma squared is a constant it will come out and what I am looking at now is sigma squared times i n minus lambda w inverse and i n minus lambda w inverse the whole thing transpose. So, let us work with its dimensions i n is a n by n w is a n by n lambda is just a scalar. So, I am working with a n by n the inverse of a n by n is a n, n by n the transpose of a n by n is again a n by n. So, overall it is as if I have sigma squared omega as the variance covariance structure of the error term u and this omega by itself is a n by n matrix right. So, so this entity i minus lambda w inverse times its own transpose is what is characterizing the off diagonal elements and spatial dependence through off diagonal elements using the weights matrix. Okay? So, I am going to write it down in a concise manner that this term here this characterizes characterizes spatial dependence through w and lambda. Lambda is to be estimated this is the term from where this idea of a spatial lag or notion of spatial lag is leading to a spatial dependence structure in the uh, error uh, variance covariance matrix. And the basic idea is that because I do not have sigma squared i n and I have sigma squared omega, I can say that is errors are heteroscedastic. Right? This is something I am very used to by now I am very used to in terms of characterizing spatial error processes. Okay? So, I have a model, I have a model which is y equals x beta plus u such that u is equal to lambda u, uh, lambda w u which is the u l term plus e and e is a homoscedastic error with expectation 0. Okay? So, this structure here implied that the variance of conditional variance of u which is also expectation of u u prime can be written as sigma squared omega with non-zero of diagonal elements and these of diagonal elements which are non-zero are characterizing spatial dependence through this interesting term i minus lambda w which is directly sourced from the model. Okay. I hope this is crystal clear for all of you. Okay. All right. So, with that, I am going to move to the next step, which is obvious next step by now. It says it is the estimation. I want to now estimate the spatial autoregressive model or the spatial error model. So, my next uh, agenda is to estimate the spatial error model. So, obviously, from what I have learned till now, you know what I am going to do? I am going to apply the FGLS strategy. And if you followed through the notes till now, FGLS strategy usually works in steps. So, we are going to have steps here. I am going to pronounce this step slowly. Step 1. What is step 1? Well, Luckily, very good for us because of the weights matrix characterization, we exactly know the variance covariance structure, right? So, we are going to write that down. So, we say we know the variance covariance matrix covariance matrix for the error term. All right. So, what is the variance covariance matrix? It is variance of u given x is equal to sigma squared omega. We have seen the exact form of omega. We have written it down previously. This thing can be written uh, is then can also be notated something that we have used earlier as a matrix sigma. Right? We know that I am going to rewrite 
omega okay now sigma inverse if i were to write sigma inverse that will be equal to sigma squared inverse omega inverse and that you can write as i minus lambda w transpose because you know when we take an inverse you know you we flip the transpose so you have i n minus lambda w transpose times i n minus lambda w and a sigma squared is written sitting right in front step 2 we are going to find a matrix t such that t times t prime times t is exactly equal to omega inverse and t is a square that is a n by n matrix it is an arbitrary n by n matrix with this property that t prime t prime t is going to be omega now it's not so hard to see that omega that t sorry t is simply equal to i n minus lambda w perfect so because i have this ready made solution in my step t step 3 i'm going to define transformed dependent and independent variables okay these are very logical steps in fgls now by now we have looked at fgls in multiple settings and i believe that you will have you know you will have a grip on why these steps are following uh, the the path that they are if you don't then you have to go back to previous lectures and revise fgls okay so i'm going to define y m which is my new so i can also instead of calling it m i'm just going to call it y new as t y and x new as t x okay now of course by definition t is 1 minus lambda w y and 1 minus lambda w not 1 sorry i times minus lambda w times x i have to always check dimensions so i'm going to do that y is n by 1 t is n by n so y is n by 1 perfect x is n by k t is n by n so x nu is n by k perfect right and i just have to keep a note that this lambda we needs we need to estimate this term okay so 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 straightforward first three steps of the fgls strategy okay so let's go and write down step 4 step 4 well step 4 we regress y nu on x nu using the maximum likelihood estimation strategy this is something that we have seen as well in lassium likelihood we declared the assumption what the assumption was declared in terms of distribution sorry we declared the distribution of the error uh, of the random structure what assumption did we start with well we declared that e had a normal distribution so we will start in my maximum likelihood, likelihood estimation we begin from there right so we know we know we know what we know that e is multivariate normal zero mean sigma squared i n variance covariance right then the log likelihood function for estimation is written as ln l beta lambda sigma squared y x so i have my parameters of interest these are all my model parameters of interest i want to estimate betas lambda and sigma squared of course lambda is my important parameter parameter of you know focus here right but 
for maximum likelihood estimation i'll be estimating all these parameters and you know at my disposal what i have is the data i have some data and i have a understanding of the population distribution i'm trying to fit the data using these flexible parameters so that you know the model fits the data in the best possible manner okay so this through this my algorithm says you have to maximize the likelihood of observing the sample given the population process and in the in the process you will estimate beta and and sigma square remember beta is a k by 1 so i have k different parameters so overall this means i have k plus 2 parameters to estimate so at least that is the size of data strength that i need so you know if i have more parameters to estimate more is the data uh, you know that i need to do that and you know you can go back and look at you know any typical standard normal distribution based maximum likelihood estimation process for a regression it is a standard you know analytic it has a standard analytical form which is the following y nu minus x nu beta times transpose y nu minus x nu beta okay now interestingly you have, we have to always check dimensions you know we have uh, uh, the first term is n minus 2 this is a scalar n minus 2 log of sigma square scalar right so scalar 1 by 1 scalar here i see something in in matrix form so y i know is n by 1 x is n by k beta is k by 1 so i have an entity which is n by 1 the transpose of this entity is 1 by 1 1 by n right it is multiplied to then uh, entity which is we have seen n by 1 so overall i actually have a scalar so it works out really well for me so all i am doing is i actually have a scalar representation on the right hand side i have some unknowns that are betas lambda and sigma squared and i will simply write the first order condition and 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 and, and just go through with this maximum likelihood estimation process in return as a solution to the above i will have beta hat fgls lambda hat fgls and uh, sigma squared hat fgls this is the solution these are going to be efficient estimators right we have seen this earlier you can go back to the theory and learn from there but these are all efficient estimators so lambda hat fgls is our parameter of focus it tells us the extent and the form of uh, you know the variance covariance structure uh, of spatial dependence uh, representation in the error term of a spatial uh, you know error uh, model okay so having understood the spatial error model its form the motivation why do we even study it and we've seen that why it should be a popular you know uh, uh, model form right and finally coming to a point where we are able to figure out how to estimate this model although of course it's a it's a highly computational exercise uh, you will see in you know upcoming uh, very soon we'll be starting hands-on tutorials and you will see that you know the software these these softwares have uh, you know a statistical software you will see that uh, estimation of a spatial error model is scanned and so is the estimation of a spatial lag model but it is good to know what's happening behind the scenes so the theory that we see here is going behind estimation of the SAR model right how does the weights matrix enter how does the you know the spatial dependence parameter lambda enter the entire story right so these are very important steps uh, in terms of understanding the results that you will see from your uh, you know uh, our tutorial exercise um, what i want to discuss for a little bit now is what is the impact of ignoring spatial dependence in model error if I ignore spatial dependence, what I'm saying is I'm assuming, assume lambda equals zero in, you know, previous discussions, right? So I'm saying as if my error term has a, uh, you know, uh, 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 
uh, uh, variance covariance structure which is represented by an identity matrix that is off diagonal elements are 0, errors are spherical, the diagonal elements are exactly the same. If I assume that and now my lambda is non-zero which is what Anselin is showing us through this simulation. So now my I am looking at lambda as my parameter of interest and as lambda increases what happens to my beta hat? You see that when lambda equals zero my expectation of beta hat is somewhere around here and it remains there for all the cases of lambda. What is happening however is that for lambda equals 0.9 there is a very large error around the expectation of beta hat and this error has gone up from considerably from the case where lambda was equal to 0 right. So what is happening is that it is it's, so lambda equals non-zero a spatial dependence and error term is bringing in inefficiency into the you know uh, model estimators that is the beta hats right. It is bringing the idea that the standard error of this beta hat will now become large and it is going to become an imprecise and inefficient estimator right. How do you go about reconciling it? The FGLS strategy that we have just seen before we saw this picture right okay. So that is almost about you know almost all about the spatial error model. I just want to talk about the variant a variant of the spatial error model which is called as the spatial moving average model. So this is called as also the SMA error model right. So I am going to briefly discuss it you know this the specification of this model is as follows. The specification is okay y equals x beta plus u something I am very used to such that now u is equal to lambda w e plus e where e is multivariate normal 0 comma sigma squared i n. Instead of u being spatially dependent on itself in the neighborhood, now it is dependent on the lags of a standard normal process, okay. So it is a variant of how in the random structure this off diagonal elements are correlated with each other. As far as interpretation is concerned, why is it different? Why is it di different, right? A question comes to us, why is it different from what we were doing earlier? Well, this setting, this particular model represents a very specific case when E represents innovation. And then WE is somehow the propagation of or diffusion of innovation, right? So diffusion of innovation right in in social sciences or in technology people are very interested in how how a technology how a, why are technologies adopted the way they are can we understand them formally can we measure the diffusion of why people buy certain types of apps on from the internet on the internet or why do they buy certain models of phones of computing devices and so on and so forth such a model is able to explain such so this diffusion of affiliation can also innovation can also be termed as the smoothening, the smoothening effect, the smoothening effect of innovation of on sorry on spatial neighbors. So it's a diffusion, right? So we are looking at how the neighbors are going to, you know, uh, 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 get this. Uh, uh, effect or how is it going to spill over to the neighbors okay. Here in order to understand how do we estimate these things you know the critical entity was this uh, variance covariance matrix sigma once you know the sigma you also know other things right. So sigma which is nothing but variance of u given x in this case is sigma squared i plus lambda w instead of i minus lambda w for SAR for SMA it is i plus lambda w times i plus lambda w transpose okay. So I would just mark out notice this plus sign as how things are different. From here on everything will follow through exactly as same as the spatial 
error model that we have just discussed in detail. Okay, so that's all about you know uh, specifying spatial dependence through the error model uh, of a spatial regression framework. Okay, so uh, we will now sort of you know by now you have uh, developed a good understanding, a good hold of how these spatial processes are specified formally. How do we measure these effects? How do we estimate these from the data, right? So going forward, you know, we are coming to, we are coming very close to, uh, you know, uh, the end of this lecture series, but, uh, and, and moving on to the hands-on exercises. But, you know, by now, you know, we have uh, formally used this device called the weights matrix in order to specify spatial dependence in either the mean outcome or the error structure, something that we started this uh, module with, right? Uh, as a next step, we will look at, uh, a, a, the uh, you know some uh, global measures of spatial autocorrelation using the weights matrix uh, based uh, notion of spatial lags, all right. And then we'll look at a couple of hypothesis tests, uh, which will be strictly time permitting. Uh, but uh, I will end this lecture here. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.